our candidates for in, in, uh, uh, joining us in this new venture and thank them for being here. Um, let's see. We are going to have um, a fairly straightforward uh, forum um, uh, presentation here. We will, uh, let's see, I need, let's see, what do I need? I need someone to volunteer to be a timekeeper. Someone who has a phone who can time our candidates for their for their speaking. Is there someone who would volunteer to be our timekeeper? Can you come down front, please? Uh, the rules will be that the candidates will be allowed two minutes of an introduction each. Uh, we will. Um, we will then proceed to some questions that were pre-selected by our executive board uh, and then we will entertain questions from the audience now um, sarah is going to distribute some pens and some uh, index cards so that you can write down your questions that you would like to have asked in the second half of the forum okay so we're going to start out with some questions that i know of already uh, the candidates will be allowed two minutes uh, to answer each question, and then we will proceed to the next question. Um, the candidates will then be allowed a final two-minute closing, and that will conclude the forum. Are there any questions about the forum, Liz? Just real quick, you might suggest putting instead of the background uh, um, to maybe the website that announces what we're going to because there are people live streaming. Or the garden party. <laughs> How about the garden? We can definitely. Have that. Is that all right? There you go. Or do you do you want to have the? Um, I'm sorry. We could we we could it, it'll it'll scroll if we leave it like this. I don't know if that's going to be annoying. <clears throat> all right. Any other questions about the format? What we're doing here? All right, uh, I'm going to go, uh, we're going to vary the order in which the answers come in. I'm going to start going this direction uh, and uh, I will allow Kim uh, Schreier, Dr. Kim Schreier to uh, start us with a two minute introduction and take it away. <clears throat> Hi, I am Kim Schreier. I'm a pediatrician, a wife, a mom. I have lived and worked in this district for the past 17 years and taken care of thousands of children and their families and boy those children grow up, a lot of them are voters now. I never thought that I would run for office, but the 2016 election was a huge wake up call for me. As a mom who has to explain to my son how this particular man became our president, as a woman concerned about reproductive rights. As a person with a background in science who worked for the EPA, concerned about the future of our climate and our environment, how slowly we are addressing it, and of course as a pediatrician, because I understand, and also as a type 1 diabetic, what it means to worry about health and health insurance. So when that first Trump care bill came out, I went with three other docs. We met with Reichert's staff, explained all the ways that that bill would be bad for our patients, for 70,000 people in this district who count on the ACA, and for people all over this country. And you can imagine my dismay when he voted for it committee anyway. And so I am stepping up because I think we deserve better. We deserve representatives who will vote for our best interests, who will remember who put them in office and act accordingly, and who will vote for us and not special interests. So that is why I'm stepping up. You can't have health and well-being without clean air to breathe and clean water to drink, without great public education, without a path to good jobs. And so I am stepping up to be a voice for families all over this district. Now, I thought I would give you some updates, um, just recent updates on the campaign. Uh, let's see, we moved out of my kitchen and into an office, which was great. We have canvassing. We have volunteer programs, and we will have an opening of our office in just a week and a half. Um, so I would be delighted to have you join. I've been endorsed by Win With Women and also with uh, the National Women's Political Caucus on top of Emily's list, and I would be delighted to fill you in more as the evening proceeds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jason? 
I knew that was going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Got light in your eyes there. Should we? Should we turn? Should we? We can turn that off. We can turn off. Right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's better. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Jason Ritterizer, and I was uh, born and raised in this district. I grew up over in eastern Washington, and I came up in a family where you learn how hard it is for the middle class to get ahead. My, uh, my dad was a police officer, and he would come home at night, he would take off his uniform, and go out and deliver pizzas in order to make ends meet for our family. I got a strong public school education, graduated from Ellensburg High School, and my first job was on a hay farm. I drove a swather and I bought hay to pay for college at the University of Washington. I got a degree in economics and then I went to work for Congressman Rick Larson in the second district and then to law school and came back to serve as a criminal prosecutor for King County. I had the privilege of going to work every single day focused on protecting the community. And then as a labor and employment lawyer, I've represented thousands of Washington workers fighting for their rights and standing up to powerful interests that don't play by the rules. Now since I've had the right to vote in this country, we have been at war. We've gone through the worst recession in 100 years, and our climate is rapidly deteriorating, and pretty much the only thing that has happened is that really big, powerful interests have gotten ahead, and the rest of us have been left behind. I don't think that our voices are being heard, and frankly, I'm angry about where this country's headed. I'm running for Congress because I think it's time for the next generation of leaders to stand up and take on our greatest challenges. I think we should lead with our values again, and to me, that means good paying jobs. As Democrats, that means we fight for unions and the right to collectively bargain. To me, it means quality and affordable education because 12th grade no longer ends, uh, is no longer the line that ends uh, public education. And to me, it also means health care for every single man, woman, and child in this country. And as Democrats, to me, that means Medicare for all, and it means a single payer system, and we're not done until every single man, woman, and child in this country has health care. I want to be the last generation to solve our health care crisis. I'm running for Congress because there's an opportunity to make a difference, and I think it's time for the next generation to stand up and take on our challenges. I look forward to the conversation tonight, and I really want to thank you for being here. Thank you. All right, I'm sorry for getting a little bit uh, of a false start on our uh, timing here, yeah. but this is our timer. She has a sign for 30 seconds. She'll, she'll hold that up, and then I think her phone will make a nice little beep. A little beep. <laughs> at, at, at full time. So, Shannon, please go ahead. Sure. Good evening, everybody. Great to see you all again. I'm Dr. Shannon Hader, and I am running for U.S. Congress for Washington's 8th district, 8th district, and I am here to ask for your support, your endorsement, and hopefully to earn your vote as well. A um, little bit of a review. I am an Auburn girl, fifth generation. Uh, I have a father who is a Navy vet and worked for Boeing for 30 years. My mom taught dance and art at community centers around this area. And I graduated from Auburn High School. Uh, went on to college to become the first person in my family to get a four-year degree. And uh, ended up becoming a doctor. I'm a medical doctor and a public health doc. And when I was done with my medical training, I chose a life of service. I joined the Commission Corps of the U.S. Public Health Service, which is one of our seven uniformed services in this country and was assigned to CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And since that time, I've been stationed and deployed across the country and across the world, really fighting disease, uh, trying to save lives, and making sure every tax dollar you gave me, I used with value to really achieve important <coughs> outcomes. In fact, I was recently back at the CDC as the director of our global HIV and TB <coughs> program. It was a really big program. Uh, 2,000 people, 45 countries, $2.4 billion a year. And at the time I left, uh, my team had contributed to the 2.2 million babies that have been born HIV free across this world thanks to your generosity and our ingenuity in figuring out how to do that. So that is something I'm very proud of. Um, that was part of a bipartisan program. And so if you look at what I've done and, and what I've experienced, I am a true believer that the government should work for the people that it can and should work. I've seen it work, I've made it work, I've seen where it's broken, it's not working at all, and that's why I'm running for Congress. I look at my family, I look at our neighbors across this district, and I don't see the government working for us. So I'm here to change that. I'm here to talk about health care, good jobs in the economy, the environment, immigration, gun safety, and I think working together, we can reach the voters, we can mobilize a response, and we can beat Dino Rossi in the fall. Thanks. Great, thank you. All right, another little change up. 
We're going to give her a little bit more visible <laughs> cards here. The orange one is 30 seconds, and this red one is 10 seconds left. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thanks for bearing with us as we get that sorted out. We're going to go to our first question. Jason, you will answer the question first. Okay. And our first question is, oh, um, I would like to ask if you have uh, any questions, please pass uh, your uh, cards towards the center so that Sarah can collect them so that we have your questions to share with them in the second half. All right. So um, what problems do you see in our criminal justice system? And what solutions would you propose? Sure. Um, I had the benefit of being on the front lines of our criminal justice system as a criminal prosecutor. Um, and I got to tell you, it's the greatest system in the world that is entirely flawed. Uh, and here's what I mean by that. Um, there is no other system in the world uh, that protects people at the same time it protects the community. Uh, but we are in need of criminal justice reform in this country in three big areas. The first is our criminal justice system still disproportionately affects those racial minorities and minority groups on the fringes of society. That's something we have to pay attention to and be conscious about. The second is we have to focus on making sure that we're not criminalizing people because they're poor. We have to revamp our bail system in America to make sure that you don't have to stay in custody simply because you can't afford the $100 in bail. Uh, and finally, from a broad perspective, we have to look at criminal justice reform from the top down. And to me, that means looking at the death penalty. As a criminal prosecutor over two years ago, I wrote an op-ed in the Seattle Times uh, calling for the, to abolish the death penalty in this state. We haven't been able to get there yet. Because to me, you cannot have ultimately a final punishment in an imperfect system. Uh, so here's what I know about our criminal justice system. We have lost trust across the country in minority groups and those folks who are disadvantaged with law enforcement officers. I grew up in a household uh, in which my father was preaching community policing in the 1980s before people knew what community policing was. And that means law enforcement are there to protect people and to trust people. We need to give our law enforcement officers the tools to be able to carry out their very, very difficult job and prosecutors the tools to carry out justice fairly and equally and make sure ultimately we reach just results. Thank you. Jen? Yeah. Do you want me to read the question again? No, it's okay. okay. I got it. I got it. Um, so thank you for that question because I think uh, when I talk about my platform and what I see this job is, is I see my job as to create a better quality of life for all of us. And to me, I talk about a little bit of old school values with maybe some new school solutions. So I want to support safe, healthy, wealthy, and wise communities. And you notice I start with safe. Um, whether it's safe from violence, from injustice, from crime, from global insecurity, if we do not feel safe together and in our community, we can't accomplish great things in the rest of that healthy, wealthy, and wise. So criminal justice system, how do we make that a core part of feeling safe and uh, try to make the areas where it's supposed to be protecting us even better and frankly taking out of the picture the places that we're making it do some work and we shouldn't. So on the first hand, um, you know, I think that our police officers have one of the toughest jobs there is. Um, I don't think I could do the job but it is a tough job and for me that means I believe in supporting community policing where our police officers really get to know the people on the ground and the community that they're trying to keep safe. Um, but we have some challenges to combat right now. I think one of our biggest challenges to combat with that is um, bias, both conscious and unconscious bias. And that's a really tough one because um, it's not just about good intentions, it's about changing actions. So training can help with that. But it's not sufficient. We also need to make sure we're looking for uh, patterns of misbehavior that we allow uh, departments to intervene on that before they're a problem and try to jump in and change things before there's a crisis. Now, just to touch a little bit on the areas that we uh, currently have the criminal justice system dealing with way too often that we need to change. Criminal justice is way too often the first line for our opioid epidemic for our addiction and for our people struggling with mental health issues. That is not a productive use of our criminal justice system and it doesn't serve those people and those issues the best. So we need to 
bolster our you know, public health and medical services on that side to take it off the burden of the criminal justice system. Thank you. And uh, Kim. Yeah, you know, the first thing that we need to do to reform our criminal justice system is to just take a really good, hard look at it. And the first thing is to come to terms with the fact that it is not equal. There is no equal justice for all in our society right now. That communities of color are hit disproportionately hard, and this does not start with the police force. This starts way back. This starts back before kindergarten, because we know that even in kindergarten, students are treated differently if, if they are from a minority population. That there is a dramatic difference between how an African-American kindergartner is punished and how a Caucasian kindergartner is punished. And that is where we need to start bridging this gap. The second thing we need to do in that vein is to work to eliminate, reduce that school to prison pipeline. Because that kindergartner, after years and years of getting disproportionate punishment in school, ends up on a track of a troubled kid. And we need to address that early on. We also need to think about prison not just as punishment. Prison should be about rehabilitated, rehabilitating. It should be about education and job training because our goal should be to reduce recidivism so that when people come out, they've paid their dues, they've done their time, they can then come out and be productive members of our society. They can contribute and not run the risk of going back in. Lastly, about 50% of our prison inmates have mental illness. Now that is appalling. You can look at that from a lot of different directions. But what it says to me is that one, we need to address mental health better in prison, and two, we need to make sure that there is follow-up after they leave prison to make sure that they don't end up right back in jail because of unaddressed mental health problems. So there's three ways that we can do it. Fantastic. All right. Did I mention decriminalization or one? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> You had six seconds left. <laughs> yeah, got it. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so let's move on to our second question. Um, I actually um, would like to take a bit of chair's privilege and add, and add a question that, that came up because of the conversation that I had uh, today um, on a, an a cru crucially important issue that I realized that we hadn't included. And um, we, we, we're currently in a situation where our <clears throat> Uh, the, the creature we call president uh, is initiating a trade war with China. Our trade situation is fraught. W Washington State, when, you, when we write to our current legislators, one of the things that they constantly parrot in, our re in responses is how trade dependent Washington State is. So uh, we've also, we've got some serious issues around trade and one of them is, uh, is going to strike home really soon is this renegotiation of NAFTA. So what, if NAFTA were to be renegotiated, what would you want to see included? What would you want to see excluded from a new North American trade agreement? And the first one will be Shannon. Sure. Um, so let me start a little bit bigger picture and then we can get back to NAFTA on that. And I think because you started with this question about the trade war is starting and this has to do a lot with our um, really unpredictable, chaotic uh, engagement in the White House and sort of blowing up a trade war potentially with China. Um, that affects us a lot here in Washington, uh, yes, because we're trade dependent, but also we have a balance of really great uh, industries and sectors in this state. We have high tech, which depends on better intellectual property laws. We have Boeing and manufacturing that depends on this export market. We have um, agriculture, and particularly our specialty crops and our cereal crops over the mountains. And we also have an Alcoa plant in Wenatchee, so aluminum, the sort of fodder of this trade war, that has been in hibernation for a couple of years. So that's just the way of saying with any of these trade negotiations, it's never going to be a simple, non-nuanced, you know, easy, automatic answer. But we know we can do better, and we can do well. And I think, uh, and take into consideration, consideration those balanced needs and come out better as Washington. Um, when it comes to NAFTA, I'm not for throwing it out, I am for updating and renegotiating it. There are a lot of things that weren't included in NAFTA that we, uh, you know, maybe uh, is not unpredictable that they didn't work out so well.
but we now have decades of experience of knowing what has and hasn't worked out so well that we can bring into a renegotiation. Um, I think in one uh, aspect that just jumps out really greatly is we need to do a better job of incorporating uh, better labor, environmental, and health standards because part of NAFTA has become a race to the bottom. Wages in Mexico have gone down, not just wages here. So it's hurt both countries by not having the kind of labor standards we know are better. And we can have examples in environmental protections and uh, health protections as well. So we need to make sure we do that, up the game, and always have, also have the oversight so that we enforce any flaws or you know, uh, violations of the new standards we put into play. Thank you. Kim. <clears throat> Well, Washington State is the most trade dependent state in the country. So how we do as a state really depends on having good trade deals. Now you did start by talking about kind of tweeting economic policy and this is exactly the reason that we cannot just go impose a tariff because the retaliation now is hitting our farmers really hard. We export 60 million pounds of apples, 72 million pounds of cherries, not to mention hay, not to mention Boeing, and those are going to be hit disproportionately hard in retaliation. So here's what we need in a trade deal. We need winners on all sides, but we really need to make sure it protects American jobs. So we need a deal where the United States is at the table, because by the way, if we're not at the table, then it goes to the lowest common denominator, right? So we need the US in the trade deal, we need to make sure there are good environmental protections on all sides and that this has teeth. We need to make sure there are labor standards and, uh, and wage standards. We need to make sure there is no child labor. And again, we need to make sure that what we are exporting are things and not jobs because we really need to protect our best interests. And finally, any trade deal has to have some teeth in it. We need to be able to enforce what we all agree on. So those are the things that I would change in a renegotiation of NAFTA. Thank you. Jason? So I used to cut the hay that depends on low-cost access to foreign markets in the Kittitas Valley. Um, we export like 90% of the hay in the Kittitas Valley, uh, and trade agreements are really, really, really important. In the 8th Congressional District, next to any other district, trade agreements are absolutely essential, and we have uh, dynamics on both sides that we need to pay attention to. First is, is labor, making sure that we're not exporting jobs along with our trade agreements. On the other side, uh, we have uh, tree fruit farmers and orchardists and hay farmers that depend on an ability to get their product over the mountains uh, into the ports and shipped out to foreign markets at uh, prices and costs uh, that are profitable for them. Forty percent of the jobs, not just in the 8th District, but in Washington State, forty percent of the jobs in this state are tied directly to trade. And so uh, I think we're all in agreement in what we need. The first thing we need to do, and what I believe in, uh, is fair trade agreements and not free trade agreements. Free trade agreements create races to the bottom, where we export jobs and it goes to the lowest denominator. But if we have fair trade agreements, where we actually have an opportunity to negotiate a deal that is beneficial to both sides. Ultimately, we'll come to the right conclusion. And, and here's where I think we need to focus in our negotiations. The first place we need to focus is in workplace safety regulations and labor standards, making sure that one side isn't able to pay uh, their workers poverty wages and drive the cost down because ultimately that hurts us too. The second thing we need to do is focus on environmental safety protections because uh, if you can manufacture something in Mexico with absolutely no standards, that's where they'll do it. And the third thing we need to focus on uh, is health and safety standards. Uh, I got 10 seconds, so I'll say this. In renegotiating a NAFTA deal, uh, we need to be at the table and we need to be a strong advocate in driving the conversation rather than letting the other folks dictate to us what's good. Great. All right. Our Third question, let's see, we just did Jason finished, so we'll have, where am I going? Shannon start. I started this time, I think. You, so Kim's right? turn. Didn't I? Yeah. Kim's yeah. turn. Yeah. I, I thought I had an assistant for her. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it could be better. 
Um, let's take this. There, there are probably going to be some more wonky questions later on, but um, let's 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 try to learn a little bit about our candidates here. Um, so, what record of performance, ability that you have, your personal qualities, or your positions on the issues that you think distinguishes you from your opponents in this race? Your, and, and I think the question was intended to be your Democratic opponents. Let's not talk about Dino Ross. <laughs> <laughs> These are fun questions. It causes me to do some introspection here. So I lean on my experience as a pediatrician and as a mom, and also as um, a daughter-in-law of lifetime republic, lifelong Republican um, in-laws. Did I say that right? In-laws, daughter-in-law of. I have a way of connecting with people from different backgrounds, different political persuasions, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic levels, and finding common ground. And I really take pride in that. And I think that is why I can go to Eastern Washington and talk with farmers and feel like I understand and they understand me and they know I will be a voice. And I can come here and talk with you. And Sue and I just had a really deep conversation before this meeting, and I think we connected really well. And I can have conversations in my hometown uh, of Sammamish and Issaquah and connect with people. In fact, I pride myself on saying that I think about 100% of my patients are behind me in this, um, which is really interesting because they cannot all be Democrats. And so I think it is the ability to reach across and connect that will distinguish me from the other candidates, and I am thrilled to say that my lifelong Republican in-laws are fully supporting me in this effort, and they have never voted for or supported a Democrat ever, ever. Great, thank you. Jason. Look, this is, this is not a Seattle suburb district. This is a district that is South King County and East Pierce County and Eastern Washington. It is at its core, small town, rural working class folks. And we've got the Cascade Mountains that runs right down the middle of this district. And I was born and raised on the other side of the mountains. I spent my uh, entire career here on this side of the mountains. And I fundamentally understand the urban and the rural divide in this district. Uh, I also have a background and an experience that I think is important in this race. Look, Donald Trump is a massive problem. He is eroding our democracy. He's a threat to national security. But he didn't create our problems. Folks have been hurting long before 2016. And I've been on the front lines fighting on these issues my whole career. I've been taking down powerful interests and big CEOs who don't play by the rules, fighting on behalf of working class folks and standing up to powerful interests when they try to take wages away from union folks or uh, fire somebody or discriminate against them. I brought the very first case in the state of Washington to protect domestic violence victims in the workplace. I brought the very first case ever in the state of Washington to fight for the rights for nursing mothers under the Affordable Care Act. And I took on Northwest Christian University when they fired a woman for being pregnant and unmarried. And now that case serves as a model for protecting pregnant women in the workplace. I've been fighting these fights long before Donald Trump showed up. I also represent a new generation of leaders. Look, there is no doubt that we cannot afford to remain in the same tired old tread tracks of the United States Congress of generations past. It is time for a new generation to stand up and take on our greatest challenges. I represent the largest voting demographic uh, in this country. I'm a 33-year-old lawyer. That makes me a millennial. Now, if we came out and drove those millennials out to vote, I think our United States Congress would look very different. I'm dedicated to making sure that we're energized to win this race, and I gotta tell you, Dino Rossi looks a heck of a lot like the CEOs that I take down on a regular basis. So uh, I look forward uh, to distinguishing myself from him as well. Great, Jim. Great, yeah, so what's different about me? Um, I mentioned that I'm fifth generation. My family's also got sixth and seventh generation all over the state. I mentioned that I was the first person in my family to get a four year degree, and I also became uh, part of a generation of cousins where every family has at least one person who got a four-year degree, but certainly not everyone. So when we look across this state with our family, we are doctor and nurses and soldiers. We are bakers and photographers and lunch ladies. 
We are IT managers and machinists and firewoman. Firewoman. My youngest cousin just became a fully fledged firewoman. So um, you know, we have a good cross section of what we are and who we are as a district. And I've spent my professional life really figuring out how to make the federal government work for people, work for people down to community level, up to national level, and out to global level. And that's why, as I mentioned, I'm a true believer it can happen. And I have, over time, jumped into things that seemed nearly impossible in order to do just that, because I knew it was possible to help people. Um, when I came back from overseas and was stationed in Washington, D.C., I found out Washington, D.C. had this horrendous, unmitigated HIV epidemic with people still dying and babies still getting infected in 2007 when this didn't need to happen. Um, we had a young, dynamic mayor at, that had just been elected there, and he asked me to actually leave the feds, leave my entire Commission Corps 20 or nothing retirement, because you don't get a payout on that, and go into this community that wasn't mine to turn around the epidemic and to turn around the agency that had mismanaged it for 25 years. And in three years, we managed to increase HIV testing fivefold, decrease death rates 30%, increase treatment coverage 50%, increase uh, early diagnosis of HIV 50%, and fundamentally change the understanding, the stigma, and the community engagement around that HIV epidemic in a way that's still pulling off today. And those are the kind of results that I expect to deliver for all of you. Thank you. Sarah, are we ready with um, audience questions yet? And you folks have been so awesomely respectful. Um, since we have a little break here, uh, why don't we give our candidates a But I, I do want to thank you for not interrupting as we go through. Uh, you, you've shown an admirable restraint. <laughs> Early evening, sort of summer evening in April, and into the darkness. So. Um, I am very privileged to be here with you all. I am privileged in what I've been able to do and meeting people and going to see groups and sitting down. The momentum of my campaign is really high and I'm inviting you all in. Uh, we've launched our Auburn office. I've been doorbelling all over the place. It seems like even in the last week and a half, uh, endorsements just sort of keep coming in. Um, a week ago or so, the Auburn flipped the eighth coalition, so Grassroots Coalition picked me as their sole endorsed candidate after a very long and very intense process with 60% of the votes. Um, after that, IBEW, Local 77, our local electricians uh, union, so Labor, uh, picked me as their endorsee. And then just last night, uh, the first of our sort of large party platforms, uh, the King County Democrats, uh, selected me as their sole endorsed candidate as well. So I feel like reaching out all over and really showing proof points, giving people an indication of what I've done and what I'm gonna do is resonating. I know it's gonna beat Dino Rossi because he's not gonna have those proof points to show people about how he's actually helped people in the past as a promise of what he's gonna deliver in the future. So I welcome you into my campaign. I'd love to have you with me doorbelling and I hope to earn your support. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to chat with you. Look, this is going to be the most consequential midterm elections, uh, certainly of my lifetime. Control of the House of Representatives runs right through the 8th Congressional District. It runs right through the 8th. The reality is, uh, if we don't take back control of the House of Representatives, uh, this country is going to look very differently in 20 years from now. We're going to be the last election to count on election night the last swing district. The eyes, literally, of the world are going to turn to us, and we can't let them down. I'm running for Congress because we need to stand up for the middle class again. We need to fight for working families. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we need to send people to Congress who are not going to be just good votes. We need to send leaders to Congress who are going to stand up and fight for people again. I'm running for Congress because I have the background and experience to be effective in doing this is a really big race. We have to pick a candidate uh, who can have an impact and who can win on both sides of the mountains in each corner of the district. 
We launched this campaign with 30 town halls in 30 days, all across the district, to make sure that we understand how to represent this district and be effective in Congress. I'm asking for your support tonight because uh, we need to stand, back, stand up and take back this country. We need to send a couple people to Congress who will fight against a Trump agenda, who will not stop until we get health care for every single man, woman, and child in this country, and who will fight against big money in politics. We need to elect leaders that uh, understand the root of our problems and how laws affect people in their everyday life. I run for Congress because I think there's an opportunity to take on our greatest challenges. I've been effective you know, one case at a time, and I think I can be effective on a much bigger scale, and I'd love to have your support because this is an important phrase. So thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Does anybody else here ever play those little games in their head, like, what would I have done in Germany in 1940? What would I have done in the civil rights era? Well, I think we are at one of those tipping points right now in our country's history. And I am concerned enough about the direction this country's headed with regard to environmental protections, health care, women's reproductive rights, public education, human rights, civil rights, free press. I am convinced that we are at a tipping point right now and that we really need to win a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives to put some checks and balances on the dangerous and chaotic policies of this administration and to advance some more progressive policies that work for everybody in the district and everybody in the country because we can do so much better. That is why I'm standing up here. That's why I'm running. I'm <coughs> leaving the medical practice that I built over almost 17 years to take this on because I think we all need to roll up our sleeves and get involved right now. And people are relating. I would say especially moms and grandmas who I meet around this district, they look at me and think, oh my gosh, she's just like me and she's running for office and we need more people like her. And that's why Tana Sen and Judy Cliburn are endorsing me, that's why Emily's List is endorsing me, that's why Win With Women is endorsing me and the, and the National uh, Women's Political Caucus is endorsing me in this race. And it's not just that. I got this sense, this spidey sense on the, on the campaign trail that, that, that my message was resonating. Well, it turns out that it is. We got internal polling back just the other day that shows that I am in great position to take on Dino Rossi and beat him and get a woman doctor as our next representative in Congress. We could use a fresh perspective a little bit of change on those 13 men sitting around the table making decisions about our reproductive rights. And so I am in this to win this because this is a race we cannot lose. The future of our country and the future of our democracy depends on it. Thank you. Once more with feeling for the honor of listening to these great people. Thank you so much for spending this time with us.